All right. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Thanks for uh, joining us today at this Lunch and Learn with the uh, for the ATA Carnet uh, webinar. Um, very pleased to have you. We're, people are still trickling in, so we're just um, continuing to let people in, but we will get the program underway. Uh, we have a lot of great material. Uh, my name is Haysom Shah. I'm with the U.S. Commercial Service in Portland, Oregon. I'm a senior international trade specialist. Our role is to help U.S. companies or Oregon's companies in, in, in our office, um, help them with their exporting needs. Um, so I'll, I'll be your host moderator today. Um, just going to be uh, monitoring the chat box. We do have a Q&A section at the end, so I know that's, it's, we'll have a lot of questions throughout the presentation. Um, feel free to put them in the chat box. And then once the presentation has concluded, you can um, raise your hand and um, unmute and turn your camera on to to ask live questions. Um, we will also be um, we'll ask that you keep your camera and mic off throughout the presentation just for bandwidth purposes and so it's not distracting for the presenter. Um, and if there are any technical issues, you're welcome to reach out to uh, Payson Siegel. He's he's copied in the last email that you have received. Um, so without any further ado, I would um, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our, our first speaker and um, our the director of the U.S. Commercial Service in Portland, uh, Kelly Holloway Jarman. Over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Taysom, and thanks for pulling this together. Um, I appreciate all of you taking time for this hour-long webinar on ATA Carnet. I'm commonly referred to as the Merchandise Passport. Today, we'll dig into what it is how you use it, what benefits it brings related to avoiding duties and taxes for international trade shows and demonstrations. Um, we're pleased to partner with Boomerang Carnet in this regard, an official appointed service provider for the issuance of ATA Carnets. Um, but at the outset, I want to thank our event sponsors, um, Business Oregon, the State of Oregon's Economic Development Group, and the Oregon District Export Council. Their support enables us to deliver export education programming such as this. Uh, so as Haysom said, I'm Kelly Holloway Jarman. I'm the director of the U.S. Commercial Service Office in Portland. Um, we are one of 100 offices across the United States and in about 80 countries, um, specifically located in embassies, consulates, and, and worldwide. Uh, um, and that is to say we have local trade advisors. You can call no matter where you are, um, who work to help your company grow exports and succeed in global markets. We're the trade experts for the federal government. Um, and if you are in Oregon, you likely know me. And if elsewhere, you can find our counterparts at uh, trade.gov forward slash locations. I'll throw that into the chat momentarily. So if you're not familiar, and just real quick, how and when you might reach out to us, um, if you seek, for example, market intelligence to inform your market and channel development strategy, due diligence on prospective partners, support in finding, qualifying, and, and meeting new distributors, um, troubleshooting import regulations, commercial diplomacy or advocacy on foreign tenders, just to give you a, a flavor for the scope in which we might uh, be able to support. So in short, please don't hesitate to reach out or your federal trade um, resource. And one last item, um, I listed just now general uh, assistance that we can provide, but to be specific, um, as we support a wide range of international business development focused activities, I want to introduce you to um, a flagship national series called Discover Global Markets, the Americas. So I'm going to screen share here. And this pulls up the right screen. What you'll see is, is the landing page for the Discover Global Markets. Um, you can see there's five locations in the month of October where we're hosting day-long seminars. We're bringing in our embassy specialists, who I mentioned, the officers and the local staff, to counsel on doing business in those markets. Um, in Portland, because I think the majority of participants on the line today are from Oregon, um, it's on October 17th. There'll be briefings, we'll be talking about import uh, issues, trade finance, and really where the opportunities in those markets are, and scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings with our visiting um, officers. 
So you can click there, you'll see their pictures. It's gonna be a great program. Um, and I'm excited to be hosting that here. So that's just one flavor of the many things that we're, we're doing. And I think I've stopped sharing there, Hasem. So uh, with that, let me, um, I know there's audience dialing in from all over. Hopefully one of those locations will work for you. We can get you in touch with our local counterparts. Um, I'm pleased to turn this back over to my colleague, Hasem Shah, who you just met, who's running the show today. And thank you again to Boomerang Carne for bringing this um, valuable content to the audience today. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop spotlighting. Perfect. Yeah, please, please do check out our DGM link. You know, this is one of our flagship events and we're putting a lot of work into it and it has a lot of value. So we really hope we, um, and if you haven't, anyone in the audience hasn't connected with your yeah, U.S. Commercial Law Service office in your backyard, please be sure to do so because uh, to quote a good client of ours, we are the best kept secret of U.S. government. So we'll, we'll continue uh, assisting as we can. Um, but right now, and a, a good example of some of our, our programming, we're re really excited to to introduce our, our guests, our speaker for today. Um, uh, he is an, uh, a, a real subject matter expert, uh, knows his, his stuff in and out. So great opportunity for you to ask questions on um, how to get stuff over to other markets and in, in a safe legal and and convenient way right um so uh the, our next speaker is a carne specialist uh customer service and sales representative uh born in illinois and has been with the company for over three years um and his time away from work you'll find him painting drawing or creating mixed media art um which i'm I'd love to see uh, at, at some point and does does play with the, the guitar and banjo and and chose uh, thank you by Led Zeppelin as his first uh, dance wedding song. So I'm uh, very, very pleased to introduce our speaker. Um, please welcome Kyle Urson from uh, Boomerang Carne, who's, who's going to be taking over. Um, and I'm just waiting to see Kyle, your camera pop on when it does. Camera should be on. Can you not hear me? I can hear you. Now we see, see you. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Over to you, Kyle. Thanks. Thanks, Hasem. That actually, I haven't heard that bio of mine in quite some time. I don't know how that one got in there, but I've actually been, again, my name is Kyle Erson. I'm a Carnet Specialist here at Boomerang. We're one of two and only two uh, appointed service providers by the U.S. Council for International Business to issue ATA Carnets. I've actually now been with the company a bit over eight years. Um, so let me go ahead and dive right into it and share our screen. I'm not sure if anybody on this call does have experience with ATA Carnets, but even if you do, I do hope that everybody at least learns a little something today. And then, as we said, we will wrap up with some Q&A if anybody has any sort of specific questions. Um, this is just the title slide, which you guys already saw. Again, this is me, Kyle Erson. It just looks like Keel. Um, as far as the agenda, we're going to start off with what is the ATA Carne for those that may not be well versed or versed at all. Uh, we'll go into a case study and examples of Carne utilization, and then we'll end with some benefits of using an ATA Carne because that's what it's all about. If this would want to change. There we go. So for this first section, what is a carne? We'll start with a practical definition and then we'll go into a little bit more of the scope of the usage of the carne. So what is it? Uh, I always read this off verbatim because I do believe it bears worth repeating. It is an international unified customs document and it provides for temporary import duty and tax deferment for three main categories of goods into a worldwide system of countries. Really, every single industry can benefit from using ATA carnets. We've seen it all. Those three 
uh, what we call the underlying conventions are international. They're universal. There's three and only three. It's commercial samples, which is exactly what it sounds like if you are a jewelry designer or a clothing manufacturer or you make a widget and you're going to go demo your wares abroad to drum up sales more on like a private type basis that would be under commercial samples professional equipment also exactly what it sounds like anytime you are going to be using that equipment in its professional capacity while abroad um, film i'll probably refer to it a lot as an example Film production is a very, very large user of the ATA Carne, but really anytime you're bringing equipment out of the country, tools of the trade, um, medical research, you know, we have universities that are clients, Boeing sending airplanes on Carnes, um, rock and roll bands, statewide orchestras, really the list is endless. And the last one is exhibitions and fairs. So if you're ever exhibiting at a foreign trade show and you're bringing your booth and all your samples, all of that is of value. And nobody wants to pay duties and taxes on something that's a temporary import just to be shown at a show. So you can pick one, you can pick all two, or two, or you can pick all three if that would be applicable. One of the nice benefits of the Carne is how universal the system is. There's about 90 or so countries currently signatory to the convention, and most countries will accept for all three classifications. Certain countries are a little bit pickier. You know, certain countries are exhibitions and fairs only. Certain countries have limitations on, you know, how long you can be in the country. But mostly, one of the great benefits is how universal in nature it is. And that's one of our jobs as the issuing agent and you know the guiding force when you're submitting your application is we're going to go through your list of countries and we're going to let you know country specific requirements where you might have issues based on intended use or length of stay or anything like that um next slide here goods allowable on a carne again it's really virtually anything some of the highlighted ones are some that we have found uh are specific to or big in your guys state in oregon particular um so we've got not an exhaustive list at all but it is manufactured goods lumber aircraft uavs jewelry the list goes on it really anything i mean we put horses on carnets going over seas for exhibition and for the olympics and for training um anything except for a very few uh, exceptions. Those would be any consumable or disposable items. So if you are going to a trade show and you have your, um, you know, your little giveaways, your swag items, your pens, your packets of paper, your brochures themselves, anything that's not going to be coming back out of the country in the same form, fashion, quantity, volume, and essentially value, wouldn't be listed on the carne. It's not to say that you can't bring those with or you can't ship those items with. It's just because they're not, you know, even if you use half a roll of tape, it's not technically a temporary import at that point. So it wouldn't be listed on the carne. And the last exception would be postal traffic. So as far as the scope of use, again, currently 90 or so countries that are a part of this thing. Again, in your guys' area, Mexico, we've heard is a big trade partner, Canada, Germany. Uh, they're all part of the commercial samples convention and they're all actually accepting to all three of those but new countries come on all the time this was actually a big year for us we got um, almost half a dozen we got vietnam we got kazakhstan recently philippines was a big one uh, peru just came on so countries are being added in our website just a brief mention, it's just atacarne.com. It's what the document is called. It's also what our website is, call it luck. But there really is a wealth of information on our website about the system in general. All the countries that accept it will keep you up to date of countries that are working on being on board. We'll keep you, you can see, you know, at ease what restrictions or requirements certain countries may have. Um, but really, it started in Western Europe in the early 60s, but since then it really has spread to most of the industrialized world. Uh, it is a single, again, unified document. It is kind of, as they said, a passport for your goods. It is valid for 12 months from the date of issue, and the more you use it, the more economical and beneficial it becomes. Um, you can go to multiple countries, multiple trips. I get asked that a lot. Hey, Kyle, I'm doing a trade show in Germany, but then, you know, two months later, I'm going to be in India with the same booth. Do I have to get two separate carnets? And the answer is no. It's not 
country or trip or shipment specific in most all respects, but it is good specific. And we'll talk about the list of goods in a bit, but as long as it's the same equipment or most countries will accept a partial import, a split shipment or a subset of that, say you had, you know, you can build like a master carnet where again, you're in the film industry and you've got, I don't know, a hundred pieces of different equipment that you could potentially take on any given trip. Well, maybe this time you need half of it. Next time you need all of it. Most countries will accept, except for like four or five, will accept a partial import, but you can't add once the carnet has been issued. And it's because of the bond that goes behind the carnet. It's really kind of the whole way the carnet works. Every carnet that's issued has a financial guarantee posted behind it in the form of a bond at the full amount that duty and tax could range up to. So foreign customs knows if you're coming in under a carne, there's already a financial backing that tells them, look, this is a temporary import. These goods are coming in, they are coming back out. And you know that because I have a carne, if for some reason they don't, they turn around and get sold while in country, or for some reason the carne is misused or it stays there longer than the validity, um, you know that there's a financial backing. So they defer the assessment on the import and only assess if the goods don't make it back out. Again, it is valid for 12 months from the date of issue, not calendar year. If we issued it today, it would expire yesterday, next year. It's always the day before the following year. Um, certain countries do and can limit the import length, either on an overarching type of policy, like Mexico, for instance, is very strict with a six month import period. India, if you're coming in under professional equipment, they limit to an initial two month import period. But most of these countries that do limit, do and often will entertain an extension of validity where you say, look, you know, our, you know, gig ran longer than we thought it was going to. We need a couple more months and you just approach customs and they will most often extend that to the full period of the carnet's validity, that 12 months. It can be issued directly to the exporter or via their freight forwarder. Either can apply for the carne. So by that, we mean we have a lot of clients that are kind of using a freight forwarder and said, look, you're handling the shipment for me. Go ahead and get my carne as well. And as long as they hold a power of attorney, a customs power of attorney, they can do that. Or certain people prefer because they know our application process is so quick and easy to just come to us directly and avoid having to go through their forwarder. So either can apply for the carne. This is, we won't spend much time on. This is just a brief graphic of where the carne system is in force. So how do they work? This is a graphic in order of exactly internationally, no matter where your carne was issued, it's the same color pages. The front and back bookends, the front and back covers are green. And we'll talk about what each of these are in just a moment. The next page is the yellow counterfoil certificates, which is for the origin countries customs. These are the trip specific certificates that get stamped and signed by customs at each point of import and export. So on the yellow, those are for US customs. They get stamped when the goods leave. They get stamped when the goods return. The white are next. Those are always for foreign customs. And again, they don't they're not country specific. That's what's nice is it's just yellow for US and white for the foreign countries. You could, you, it's not, doesn't say Australia or Germany or what have you on there. It's just yellow for US, white for the foreign countries. You'll see on the white, there's a second page behind it in this graphic because on the foreign counterfoils, they also have voucher pages. So the vouchers are kept and retained by customs when you enter and exit that foreign country. The counterfoils are your proof. That's your record. That's your registration of the imports and the exports. Those always stay in your card. It's kind of like your receipt. But in the foreign countries, because that's where the liability lies, they do also need to keep record of it. On a US issued card in particular, there are only yellow counterfoils. There are no yellow vouchers. All US, they did away with them a long time ago. All US Customs really cares to see when you get back is that they can see that it was stamped and signed when you left because there's no real liability for US returning goods. You're not going to get a, a claim from US Customs for US returning goods. So as long as when you get back, they can see that it was validated and activated when you left, they know it's US goods returning. But again, in the foreign countries, 
you could turn around and sell that. So they do need to keep record of it. So when you enter a foreign country, they'll stamp your counterfoil for import, but they'll also stamp that corresponding import voucher and remove that and keep that as their registration of the import, their receipt, so to speak. Same thing when you go to leave, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, but yellow for US, white for the foreign countries. There's also blue pages if anybody does have experience uh, on this meeting with Carnets or have used them or have shipped with them, you may very well have never seen blue pages in your Carnet. I don't wanna say it's an antiquated notion, but they're called transit counterfoils and vouchers. Those do have vouchers. Um, they're called transits. Traditionally, they were used for bonded inland travel to get you from one port to another port in bond. A good example is Italy used to use them for fine jewelry. A lot of fine jewelry gets imported into Italy and the John Smith customs agent at the port does not feel comfortable validating $200,000 and inspecting and verifying $200,000 worth of fine jewelry when that's not his world. He has no experience with jewelry, so they would use a blue stamp you at your port of import, they would use a blue counterfoil to get you in bond and under guarantee from the main port that you entered at to an offsite facility that does strictly specialize in jewelry. That being said, they are very rarely used anymore. There are six countries out of this entire convention that even if they don't want to use them, they require them to be in there. That is Bulgaria, China, Italy, Poland, Russia, and Switzerland. Again, part of our job as an agent, if I see an application or you call me that you have a new trip and you say, hey, Kyle, I'm going to Switzerland, we'll put the blues in there. Kind of at their discretion if they use them, I would say most of the time they don't. If you're ever hand carrying and they don't stamp in one of those six countries, the blues, and they don't touch them and they only do the whites that every foreign country uses, that is totally fine. And I feel like a lot of times that's what happens. So if they don't touch the blues, you guys you don't have to say, hey, what about these blue pages? And then the back cover is green. So this, um, oh, circling back just for a second, my apologies, on a US issued carnet, in specific, again, there are no yellow vouchers. In most foreign countries, though, originating in a foreign country, they do have yellow vouchers. For example, we're the only Carnet company that we know of that issues Carnets in two different countries worldwide. We issue them for both US exporters as well as UK exporters, and all of our UK issued Carnets, we partner with the Liverpool Chamber over there those do have vouchers. So it comes up a lot. I get a lot of calls where customs are confused why there's not yellow vouchers, but on a US one in particular, there are not, but most international ones are. So that was in order of their issuance and how they're gonna appear in your Carnet document when you get it. This, you'll see the yellow comes back uh, towards the end because this is in order of how they work and how they are used. So again, your front green cover page is first. It's kind of like the heart or the meat and potatoes of the Carnet. It's got all your important information, your Carnet number, your expiration date, your list of authorized representatives, which is who you as the holder company deem authorized to handle any dealings and travel with your Carnet or ship. So if it's a hand carry, you would list everybody you could potentially see that would ever travel with it. If it is a freight shipment, you would list your freight forwarders and any third party brokers or forwarders or freight agents that might be involved behind the scenes, maybe in the foreign country. Um, so it's got that, it's got the list of all the countries that it's good for. It's got where you sign it to activate it. Um, as the holder, it's got where customs activates it upon first use. They, US customs will always, when you present it, for the first time, stamp and sign in two places, one on the front green cover page, and then also that's the activation, but then they also need to get you out of the country. So they'll immediately flip the page to the yellow exportation counterfoil and stamp you out of the country for that trip. If you use the Carnet again, which hopefully you do, so you get more benefit out of it, they would never stamp and sign that front green cover page again. It's just once to activate it. On the reverse, and some of our other webinars and all over our website is resources of what these pages actually physically look like. Um, but on the reverse of that front green cover page is what we call your master general list. In our world, it's kind of a deceptive term. It's a detailed list, a very detailed itemized list. We do not need HS codes or any customs, you know, commodity codes. It requires more physical identifiers. So you want each piece on its own line, 
things like make, model, and especially serial number or part number. If any of your items are serialized, that's how Customs identifies the goods. They don't know one camera body from another, or one guitar from another, or one piece of artwork from another. So they look to things like physical identifiers, especially serial numbers, to say, okay, clearly what they're carrying and what's in front of me that I'm doing an inspection on is what's listed on the card. I, I can match it up to the digit, being completely ignorant to their industry. I can know then that what they say they're bringing is what they're actually bringing. Thusly, I know that the duty and tax is guaranteed for the correct value. They're not telling me it's a $10,000 camera body and coming in with a $100,000 camera body. Uh, I can match it up to the serial number. So again, U.S. Customs will stamp your front green. They will stamp you out of the country on the yellow exportation counterfoil, showing that the goods were officially exported from the U.S. Again, no vouchers are kept in the U.S. It's just the counterfoils. You fly over to France, you land, you let customs know, I'm here on you know, business, I'm gonna be doing a trade show, here is my carnet. They will stamp and sign your white importation counterfoil, whatever numbered set you're on. And they will also immediately then, again, the counterfoil stay with you, but they'll immediately then flip the page, pull out, fill out, stamp and sign and remove that corresponding and keep that corresponding importation voucher then you go you do your job and on the way out it's all the reverse so you go you approach customs let them know you're leaving with the goods french customs will stamp and sign the white re-exportation counterfoil we call them a set because on the yellows it says export number one and then re-import number one and on the whites it says import number one and re-export number one so it's a set so that corresponding number say you're on your first one the number one import counterfoil and voucher was stamped when you entered, that number one set will be closed out for re-exportation when you leave. So they'll stamp your re-export number one counterfoil, they will flip the page, remove, and keep that re-exportation voucher as their receipt. That way they know when this carnet expires, okay, look, they brought the goods in on this day, they brought them out on this day, they followed the rules, they stayed within the time period, and they match up the vouchers, and that's how you avoid the claim. Blues are the blues. If they're used, they're used. If they're not, they're not. Again, if it's one of those six countries, we'll make sure they're in there. And then coming back into the U.S., you go through customs, you let them see your carnet. They may or may not do an inspection on the goods at each one of these points. Usually if they do, especially with a hand carry, it's going to be more of a spot check where they'll match up, you know, a couple of serial numbers of the big ticket items. But they could, you know, be that one guy who's in that one mood and want to match up each and every item and each and every serial number. So that's why you want to be as detailed as possible. But U.S. Customs will stamp it back in and then you're done. Um, again, it's valid for 12 months, so feel free. It's your car now. You've got it for a year. Things happen. Other trips can come up, so keep on to it. But if you knew, say, it was a one and done, you would just return the car now to us at that point, and we would get it closed out for you. Um, and we would, again, our claims manager and our claims department goes through every car now that comes back. They also match up the stamps and the dates. And if it's clean and all the stamps were obtained correctly, which hopefully they were, they'll close it out. And then you'll get an email notifying you that your carnet has been closed and your bond has been canceled. If for some reason there's a missing stamp somewhere, things happen, maybe you're running late for your flight, or despite your best efforts, you can't find customs anywhere. You know, don't panic, don't miss your flight because of it. Just make 100% sure you get it stamped coming back into the US. That's the quickest, easiest, strongest way that we fight that claim. Because no matter what happened in the foreign country, it proves that after the date it entered into their commerce and before the carnet expired, John Smith, U.S. Customs agent, put his seal of approval saying these goods did come back to the U.S. But our claims department is phenomenal. We have many ways of fighting. We're always going to battle tooth and nail for you to get those claims closed out. And then the back green cover page is just kind of like the end cap. It's got notes on the usage of the carnet. It's got the list of all the foreign countries and their guaranteeing associations. It also has what of the three conventions they accept for if they do end up limiting to exhibitions and fairs only, what have you. But it's also got your contact information for your agent who issued it. So you know where to return it and who to reach out to if you need anything. So there's some conditions to be um, followed with a carnet for sure, just like anything else. The main, main one that we always try to hammer home is timely re-exportation. 
The expiration date of the carne is the date the items ideally need to be returned to the US, but definitely out of the foreign country. Sometimes if you're doing an extended research and you're up to the last week and you get the goods out of Germany, but it's going on a vessel and then it expires you know a month at sea during transit it'll be at u.s customs discretion but they can accept an expired carne as the valid means of re-import but ideally it's best to try to get the goods back into the u.s prior to that expiration date because if they leave the foreign country after that date foreign customs could and would charge either the full duty and tax and or a regularization fee. And you'll see the little arrow and the asterisk at the bottom. Beware of that final date of re-export. Again, it's part of our job to coach you. If you're going to Mexico, I'd say get them out within six months. But on any given import, customs could, it's rare, but they could limit to something less than the 12 months on that particular entry. So don't just assume that you always get the 12 months, be cognizant of it and inspect it after it's handed back to you from customs or have your freight forwarder send it back to uh, send a scan to you to make sure that on that import counterfoil, the second box says final date for re-export, make sure that they dim it, didn't limit that because if they did, then you don't have the 12 months and you got to get it out within then. If, um, real quick before we move on, most countries and again, other of our webinars go a little bit deeper into this, but most countries, if you can't get it out by the expiration date, most countries will accept what's called a replacement carne, another deceptive term. It's not like, oh, I lost my paperwork within the first 12 months, I need a replacement. That in our world is called a duplicate carne, but a replacement is a very unique carne that's issued. It's a new bond, it's a new carne, but it's directly tied to the original and it's used to extend the stay in the foreign country past that initial expiration date. So if you're ever on month 10 or 11 out of 12 and you say, oh, look, Kyle, I, I just can't get the goods out or it doesn't make economical sense for me to ship them back and then ship them back under a new carne, reach out and we can go through the replacement carne process in most all countries. Unlike an original though, where we practice a 24 to 48 hour turnaround, you wanna apply for replacements at least a month in advance because we've gotta get the app in, we've gotta take it down to customs for you, we physically do that for you and have it activated, and then we need to send it over seas to marry up with the original so both carnets can be presented to customs and both carnets stamped and that liability transferred from the first to the replacement all before the original expires. So always try to apply for a replacement at least a month in advance. But this uh, next section, Let's talk about a case study so you can see the savings and then tips and examples. So this is a very interesting slide because it kind of puts it in black and white. Well, rather lots of color. Um, it kind of shows you this is one of our clients. And at the time I ran this data, they had done 213 carnets with us since 2010. Their destinations were really worldwide. They used carnets greatly to their benefit. I'm sure saved a ton of money in doing so, but key highlighted ones were China, the EU, India, South Korea, Japan, and Mexico. So across those 213 different goods, sets of goods covered under 213 carnets, their total value was almost $22 million worth of goods. For that, their total out-of-pocket carne cost for those 213 carnets was 167k and it might sound like a big number but if we usually say duty and tax could range up to 40 percent right duty is duty it's often recoverable sometimes easier said than done trying to get your money back from customs when you prove that the goods were re-export takes time it takes effort i've talked to fortune 100 companies that have had millions of dollars on duty deposit for years at a time and if say you have an exchange rate change in our currencies of over that time you just created a permanent loss but duty is duty it's often recoverable um but if we look in the bottom left 20 percent even on you know have that number 4.36 million dollars 40 percent on the higher end almost nine million dollars but the VAT alone, just the import taxes, if we look at that, China somewhat on the higher end, 17%, just the taxes, $3.71 million. Sweden, even higher, 25% VAT tax, 
five and a half million dollars. Canada, one of the lowest countries as far as import taxes go at only 5%, still over a million dollars that they would have paid instead of 167 had they not been using Carnets. So it kind of just shows, you know, just how grand of a cost and, and economical savings you get when you're using your Carnets for your temporary exports. So just a few tips to be prepared. You want to plan ahead, especially if it's a cargo shipment, get your freight forwarder involved early, you know, get your application in early. That being said, we are very quick to turn around. Um, we practice 24 to 48 hours. We do Carnet's same day even. We have a network of printers. It can't just be emailed to you. They are working on the e -carne. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's definitely going to take some time. Um, but currently, if you need a Carnet and you need to travel tomorrow morning, and again, in the film industry, you have trips come up at the drop of a hat. And if you beat the other guy there, you get the gig. So we've got printers in L.A., uh, Dallas, uh, New York, smattered throughout the country. So we try to turn them around just as quick as humanly possible and can even do it same day. But try your best, especially because, you know, FedEx, UPS, e-commerce in general lately is kind of nobody's friend. There's been a lot of delivery delays. So if you can do it a week in advance, that would be safe. But definitely try to submit your app at least two to three days before your travel so that we can get it issued. We can make sure it's issued correctly with you and we can get it delivered to you safely and not have to worry about you know, FedEx overnight delays. Um, always inspect your carnet for accuracy before you travel. Once you have it, make sure before you go that the people traveling are listed as authorized representatives on there. Again, the people that the holder company deems authorized to handle the carnet on their behalf. If something needs to be changed, you know, a year's a long time, things happen, you get a new colleague on board, we can always issue a quick authorization letter for you at the drop of a hat. You could even draft it up on your own company letterhead because you're the holder, but make sure to check stuff like that so you're not getting to the airport and custom says, well, who are you in box B? And you say, well, I'm James Smith. And they say, well, John Smith is on here. You're not on here. So check things like that. Definitely review your list double, triple check serial numbers. Again, those are very key with customs. You can order additional counterfoils. It happens more, not often, but it happens more often that we would like to see people get to the airport and they're like, oh, I got my carne six months ago and they go to present it and customs says, well, you're out of the counterfoil certificates. This, you, there, there's nowhere for me to stamp, you can't travel. So make sure you check that. You can always order them online. We can overnight them to you pretty much any day. And then also note any split or partial shipments. Be very clear with customs when you're doing a partial because if you have 100 items and you only bring 70 and you're not clear with them and they mark one through 100 when you enter into India and you don't notice that and then you come out with 70 items and you say, well, I swear I didn't enter with these. They say, well, the carne says you did. So always be clear about things like split or partials. Um, arrive early at the airport. I'm personally a person with travel. I'd rather sit there and wait than be running late for my flight, but especially with carnets, because your first step is to actively seek out customs. So leave yourself time, call customs in advance, figure out how long they recommend that you get there. Um, make sure you know where you're going, make sure you know where the office is, but definitely arrive early. Because if you don't and you can't get your carne stamped and activated for validation for, for export and you get to the foreign country, they could and more than likely would reject the carne because it wasn't validated. So show up early, know where you're going, schedule appointments if you can. There's a link here and I'm sure this presentation will be shared. Uh, we have a very handy page of our website that has customized airport maps where it shows you it's not every airport in the world, but a lot of the major ones, especially domestically, we do have concrete confirmed info where, OK, customs is here. Take this hall, go past the McDonald's. Here's the phone number so that you can call. If we ever don't have one of the ports that you're looking for, use the US Customs website. There's a tool on there where you can at very least get the phone number for any port in the US and know where you're going, what time you're showing up, uh, stuff like that. Look up country advisories. Again, it's a very universal system. It's one of the great benefits of it. But Mexico, for instance, they have this weird advanced registration that I as the agent have to file for you. We don't charge for it. You don't have to worry about it. But if you're, say, on your second or third trip and you originally applied for a carne for Australia and you didn't tell us that you were going to Mexico and you showed up and I couldn't have 
known that and I couldn't have filed that registration for you, they'd be looking for a registration that you don't have. So always, again, our website is very detailed with all that, but just pick up the phone, call us, and we'll let you know if and what you need to know about that country. Uh, and in that vein, we are truly a 24-7 company. It is not a line. Uh, if you call in the middle of the night, uh, 800 number is not like anybody else's 800 number. There's no annoying menus during business hours. It goes right to my team on operations. We practice trying to pick up within two to three rings. Uh, after hours, it'll go direct to our president and CEO, Mr. Kurt Wilson's cell phone. He takes calls in the middle of the night, probably more than he would care to admit but especially with the time difference between us and our UK office. But I've literally issued carnets on Christmas Eve before. After hours, holidays, weekends, we really do care and we really are here for you. So take advantage of that. Another good tip about the carnet that some people don't know is you can sell goods off of a carnet. It's obviously not the intention. You're trying to gain the benefit on a temporary import. Goods go in, they come back out. But it happens a lot in like the commercial samples world. If you're a example I often use is if you're a fine jewelry designer and you're taking 100 pieces of fine jewelry to a trunk show in any foreign country and your hope, your dream is that all 100 pieces sell. Well, maybe the rea reality is one third sell or half sell. Well, you can sell the ones that do sell. You don't have to send them back to the US and send them back as a permanent import. You can break that liability right there and then and only pay duties and taxes on what does sell and defer the duty and tax on everything that does come back out. We would obviously direct you through that process, but the Reader's Digest is you approach customs, you take the carne, you let them know what will be sold. They'll probably ask for a receipt or a bill of sale or something like that. You will pay customs duties and taxes at that time. You get a paid receipt for that from customs. They will write a few things on the carnet counterfoil as well as on the receipt, kind of cross-referencing each other. On the receipt, they'll notate the carnet number and on the re-export counterfoil, they will indicate which line item numbers um, were sold and their verbiage is diverted to free circulation with duties and taxes paid. That way, when you do get back or when your carne expires and you send the carne back to us and copies of the receipts, we can see, okay, well, not all the goods did come back out of the foreign country, but we can close out that carne and close out that liability and cancel that bond because the liability was satisfied when the duties and taxes were paid uh, to foreign customs. And the last one, just some benefits of the carnet and our contact info. Really, the key is it is a tremendous money saver. It covers all the goods you want to list on it for a full 12 months. No high import duties and taxes due. No filing, you know, temporary import bonds like a TIB or duty drawback and VAT recovery in each and every country. You've got it on hand. It's not country specific. You can travel ship to multiple countries. The more you use it, the more economical it becomes. Um, again, can be used for both hand carry trips and cargo shipments. So in, it's not restricted. We ask in the application what your initial method is, but it's not restricted to that. So you could hand carry there and then ship it back. You could do it hand carry both ways. You can do it cargo shipment both ways. You can do it hand carry this time and cargo next time. It's not restricted to any one method of travel. So again, big benefit is how by and large across the system as far as the document and the countries, how universal and malleable uh, the carnet usage is. And then also, I don't know if anybody's ever filed the US Customs Form 4455 Certificate of Registration this would take the place of that. So less paperwork to fill out, no bonds in each and every country, no filling out the 4455, or if you forget to do that, filing a US goods returned entry when it comes back, it handles both sides of the coin, both getting into and out of the foreign country, as well as getting back into the US, which is sometimes half the battle, if not more, is clearing it back home and proving that it originated here. And this is us, that's our 800 number. Again, not like any other, goes right to our team. 
Uh, that is our website. If you take nothing else from this, please just visit our website. There is a true, true wealth of information on there about the system in general. We've got Making Carne Easy video series. We've got the airport maps. We've got click to chat, which is not AI. It is not a bot. It goes right to my team on operations. You're talking with the live person. We've got alerts, blog posts, airport. I mean, the list is endless. Really check it out. That's our mailbox. Again, very easy. Carnets at atacarnet.com. We monitor that live as well. Um, my team on operations, that goes right to us. And those are our socials. And lastly, this is me. Again, Kyle looks like Keel. That is my personal email. If anybody ever has any questions, wants to email me, that is my direct phone number. And how are we on time? I think that leaves perfect time for Q&A. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Heisem. Yeah, hey, Kyle, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop spotlighting. We um, had a nice trickle of questions come in. Um, so if you can see the chat, Kyle, and I, I suspect a few of them were answered through your presentation, but um, I can read them out for you. If you can take a quick glance, I think you might even be able to clump a few of them together. Um, but if anybody wants to ask a live question in real time, you're welcome to raise, use your uh, raise hand function, and then I can unmute and um, open up your camera. But Kyle, let me know if you can't see the chat. I can read out some of the questions for you. I can see it and try to lump them as best I can, but we'll go in order. First, we've got Victor uh, saying, does China, India, and South Africa accept carnets for film equipment specifically? The answer is yes, but it wasn't always yes. China and India prior to, I want to say it was 2019, only they were one of the pickier countries. They only accept carnets, accepted carnets under the classification of exhibitions and fairs. So trade shows, public events, special meetings, exhibitions. So if you were working with a fixer back then, sometimes they can grease the wheels and get you through, even though you're clearly carrying film equipment, but and not a trade show booth under your arms. But a lot of times it was problematic because you're not coming in for a trade show. Sometimes you can get away with saying, I am going to film at a show, which is often the case. And sometimes that would work, but thankfully and gratefully back in 2019, they both opened up the floodgates. So China and India now do, except for professional equipment. India, I think I mentioned the caveat is on an initial import. They limit when you're coming in under professional equipment, which of course film equipment qualifies for. They limit to a two month import period to start. They will honor one extension for up to another two months, but the most you would have in country with professional equipment would be four months in India. China, you can have the year. South Africa, you can have the year. And then next, you said, did a shoot in Ecuador. Our flight started. We did a shoot in Ecuador. Our flight started in Arkansas, but left the U.S. out of Miami. We had to go outside of security to the customs office to get the carnet signed off. Is there a way to do this ahead of time so we don't? Oh, it is the biggest thorn, one of the biggest thorns in my side as far as customs goes. If and it's getting worse in recent years, unfortunately. Our guaranteeing association, the United States Council for International Business, is working diligently to try to get customs on board with not having it be at the final port of export. So in that, that example, he was flying Arkansas, had a connection in Miami before they physically left the country. If you can ever do a direct flight out, especially in recent years, even if it costs more money, obviously it's not always an opportunity, but always make sure it's a direct flight out so that you can not have to mess around with it at your layover. A lot of ports though, don't mind. I've seen people in you know the middle of Montana that customs is only there once a week for a few hours. So they go two weeks in advance and get their carnet stamped, let alone having just a silly little connection flight. But it is often customs contention that they want to see the carnet stamped at the final port of export from a country and the first port of import. So call us. We will do everything we can. We're always even willing to talk to customs. But if they push, and they insist there's often not much we can do. There's actually a customs muster topic right out of their 
quote unquote rule book that says the final port of export can be considered the final port where the person has access to the goods. So if you check it in and you can't access it, how are you supposed to manipulate it? So we can provide that kind of documentation to you. But unfortunately, if they push and they say no, too bad, so sad, you got to get it done at the final port, then you got to figure out and talk to that port on where, when, and how to do an in transit slash layover validation. Sometimes they'll say, look, there'll be somebody in your terminal, go talk to them. We get it, they're checked in. It's what they consider a secure supply chain um, and just show them the carne. Sometimes you do have to gate check or uncheck and get through customs and make sure that that layover is a somewhat extended layover. Because if you can imagine, how are you supposed to uncheck, get through security, get to customs and still make your flight within an hour or two layover? So again, direct flights are the, the best. Um, I hope that answered your question, Victor. What do you do if you give away samples while there? Um, I'm assuming that's for like a trade show or something like that, but either way, again, those types of things can't be listed on the carne. It is not to say that you can't bring them or ship them with if you're shipping them, ask your freight forwarder. They're going to be the ones to best guide you on how to do like a consumption type entry. Um, if you're hand carrying and it's just a few little samples and you've got your car nail buttoned up for everything else and it's low enough value stuff, oftentimes the customs isn't going to waste their time or yours, you know, wasting everybody's time collecting five, 10 bucks in duties and taxes, but they could. So if they see that there are consumable, disposable, even if you're not selling them, you're giving them away, they do unfortunately have the authority to charge you import duty and tax and make you file a consumption entry because it's technically goods entering into their commerce and not coming back out. So I hope that answered that one. Are amendments allowed to ATA Carnage to include additional items or add more countries? Very informative. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you saying that. Um, amendments are in certain respects. You can always add more countries. You would just order additional counterfoils. Again, certain countries are pickier than others. We'll advise you if you're going to have an issue. By and large, again, it's a very universal system. Amendments as far as adding items are not possible except for one unique instance. If you ever get a carne and within 14 days, and this is a US Council rule, not an US rule, so there's no wiggle room. Within 14 days of the carne's issuance, you can do what we call a cancellation, where say you realize at the last minute you wanted to rent more stuff from the rental house or you had to add items. If you can get that hard copy to two qualifiers, it can't have been used and stamped by customs. So if you made a quick trip and then you wanted to add in <clears throat> items, it can't have been user stamped by customs and the hard copy of the carnet needs to be returned to our office within 14 days. Then you can do a cancellation and reapply. It's just a small bond cancellation fee, but you'll get most all the funds returned for your carnet. So that's really the only technical way you can add items, but physically adding it to the carnet after the two weeks is not possible, unfortunately. But the countries, yeah, you can always order additional certificates. Um, can you do a duty free temporary export without a carne? There's other ways to do it. Like I said, you can work with brokers and file uh, temporary. Usually the main one is what's called a TIB, a temporary import bond, but there's certain requirements like you usually have to have an importer of record, which is not always the case for people. You can do a duty drawback and bat recovery where you pay the duties and taxes up front or a portion of them and then claim it as a temporary import upon entry. And then when you prove that the goods are re-exported, you can recover that. Again, a lot of times easier said than done, but we're strictly carne, a broker and a forwarder would be better posed to advise you on alternative duty and tax free methods. But usually people gravitate towards the carne because of the ease of its use, it's most often the most cost effective way to do it and you don't have to get a broker involved. You can just hand carry. I hope that was what you're asking. I hope I answered that. Uh, can you check the samples in luggage? Yes, you can. You can. In our world, it's a deceptive term. You think hand carry, carry on, 
hand carry is any time that you are traveling with the goods themselves, be it checked in to the belly of the plane, be it carried on, or a mixture of the two. So yeah, you can definitely put them in your luggage. It's because you go see customs first. And that's if they're going to do an inspection, they would do it at that point. So you go see customs first, get your carnet stamped, then you go through your normal boarding procedures and it can go anywhere on the plane. Uh, if you export it, yeah. Could I jump in and mm -hmm. just for a second be rude and interrupt and pause? I think um, we are running right at the end. I know we've got a few, we've just got three minutes oh. left. Um, to all the questions that are in the chat box, I'm wondering if we can, um, if Kyle, you're okay to, uh, to get reached out um, and, and if people reach out directly to you, uh, we can also, I'll send these questions over. Um, I think some of the names are quite familiar, so we can put you in direct contact if that works. Happy to, happy to. Excellent. No, I really, really uh, just want to thank you, Kyla. It, it, your your expertise is important. I, I really value the takeaway, um, you know, which is if you uh, have questions about this, reach out, right? If, if you are concerned, here's the website. Um, if you want to look at more resources, just have a conversation, pick up the phone call and, and talk. And I think in that same vein of resources and and getting assistance, um, I want to close this out by um, introducing uh, Steve Thompson from Business Oregon. Business Oregon is the state of Oregon's um, uh, tr economic trade uh, development agency, and they um, help us with a lot of our programming. Um, are a great resource for. Um, Oregon's clients and Oregon's exporters who are looking for assistance in a variety of different ways. So, Steve, I don't, I know I have to to find your box and then um, unmute you. So, I'm just going to see if I can do that. Always doing but... that. Just thanks to everybody for joining. Thanks. Say some thanks to everybody for having us. And again, please feel free to reach out. But with that, I will jump off camera. Have a great day, everyone. Oh, thanks so much and sorry for the kind of abrupt end, um, but I'm you're giving. Giving Steve, Steve, you are good to go. You should be good to go now if you want to turn your camera on. The camera and my mic, can you hear me OK? Good to go. OK. Uh, well, hey, some thank you so much for having me and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to be very brief. Um, basically, uh, all, almost every state has uh, the equivalent of, of Business Oregon. Uh, it would either be called the Department of Commerce or something along like those lines. I'm actually going to um, send a link through the chat now if you wanted to look up your own state's um, directory uh, of information. Um, I manage our export promotion program, and one of the uh, components of that is called the STEP program, the State Trade Expansion Program, which is uh, issued by the Small Business Administration, the SBA. Uh, we apply, apply for a grant each year, and um, and once we're accepted for that, uh, every October 1st, uh, we award money to companies in Oregon, and, and any of you that are from outside of Oregon, uh, you can go to uh, your state uh, organization and, and request this as well. Um, but what we do is we offer uh, up to 50% of the cost of attending a trade show or a trade mission um, to sell internationally. That's the goal. We're looking to identify opportunities abroad for you. Um, Kelly and Hasem's team uh, through U.S. Commercial Service, there are programs through them that are eligible. And so our goal really is to help you uh, identify those opportunities that you're you're looking to make internationally, whether it's um, it's a um, uh, opportunity for sales, whether you're looking for distributors, you're looking for partners, all of those things are covered. Um, but primarily what we focus on is, is trade shows and trade missions. So um, I am happy to, uh, to chat with you if you're here in Oregon. And uh, you could just look me up in that uh, list that I sent. And um, we'll go from there. Thank you. Well done, Steve. Right on time. Um, so we are, uh, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. We are a minute over. This was um, 
fantastic, lots of great information. And uh, we really appreciate you all taking time out during your day. We hope you did grab some lunch while while you learned. And um, uh, thanks thanks for, for, for jumping on. And best of luck. Happy exporting. Please reach out to Kyle if there are any any other questions and uh, possibly questions that we didn't address. Uh, but thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the sun wherever you are. For most of our Oregon and Portland attendees, take advantage of it. It's good weather out there. Thanks, everybody. Stay well. <laughs>